Please rise for the pledge. Good evening, everyone. Anyone here for public comment? Public comment? Anyone? Nope. You're not here for public comment, right? Well, I thought I would chime in during split tax classification. You got it. But I can step up now if you want to figure out the your agenda. No, no, no. We're good. We'll, we'll wait. We'll wait. Okay. Um, board member reports. Anyone? Just to let you know, Michael, we have oh, another sorry. water meeting scheduled for next Wednesday okay. at 1 p.m. We continue our dialogue related to the uh, focus probably on the chlorination. Yeah, yeah just that we've also uh, been in contact with uh, you know, another property owner on Route 28 in relation to um, potential for locating uh, the chlorination plant. Uh, that's moving forward. We're going to have another meeting with uh, this party uh, this weekend, and uh, hopefully making some more progress in, uh, in relation to you know the article that was in the paper Thursday and potential for uh, our interest in another parcel on Main Street. Um, just for informational purposes, that particular parcel appears to be a little bit too southerly on 28 in order to be ideal for us. So. It probably is not in the equation at this particular point in time. I mean, as a last ditch effort, maybe it's something available, but it's not uh, really in the equation at this point because it's a little too far south on 28 in order to uh, to meet our needs as we see them today. Okay. Um, additionally, uh, just the Thanksgiving dinner, annual Thanksgiving dinner at uh, Hillview, uh, sponsored by uh, Representative Jones and his wife Linda and uh, Senator Tarr, who was terrific and uh, wonderful annual occasion and it's great to be there. Uh, it was uh, sad that uh, Senator Tao was not able to make it because of the death of his brother the night before. Uh, so to uh, Senator Tar, you know, our condolences and we missed uh, his presence there and um, we appreciate the, uh, the sponsors and the sponsorship that, that he and again Representative Jones's wife Linda and uh, the local businesses uh, to provide the annual uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Well attended, good meal, good entertainment, good company. That, that's it, Mr. Ditto Chairman. on that. Anyone else? Yeah, just real briefly, I want to remind the public that the uh, tree lighting ceremony is this Sunday and on the common uh, late in the afternoon. And I also want to, I see Al Pereira's here, I want to congratulate you on your successful Main Street lighting program. It's great the businesses light, light it up. Uh, next year, I'd like to see those two events combined, like one big event, but uh, you get those. Great event coming up this weekend. You had a great event yesterday, and I think that's great for the community. Thank you. So I have something, but before I do that, before the FCC calls me, I just need yeah, to read this real quick. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM. It may be recorded by other local media. Check that square. So I have something real quick I just wanted to share with the board, share with the public. In September of 2018, Mass Department of Public Health and Human Services voted in new state food codes. And they're pretty challenging. Um, I'm in the industry a little bit, I've been reading them, and I have spoken with Mr. Bracey about it. And you know, these are things that really refer to how companies in town that provide food service, you know, their operating procedures or the hand washing procedures or record keeping or it could just be temperature controls and things like that. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work. Uh, the local board of health will be holding mandatory courses for the local food establishments to come in and get educated a little better on these codes so they can bring all their restaurants up to the right codes. Uh, Mr. Bracey uh, informed me that he invited um, Kitty's owner, Mr. Scott White, to attend these as a guest speaker so he can share with him the positive outcome that he has had in his restaurant and implementing these. He's probably one of the only restaurant owners in, at least I know locally, and probably in, even in the local area that has been successful in implementing these very challenging 
new food code. So I want to congratulate him, congratulate his staff. I also want to get the board's support to send a letter on behalf of the board recognizing Mr. White for his willingness now to go out and help all these other local restaurant establishments to help them get up to speed and become fully compliant like Kitty's is now. And, um, you know, it's a nice thing. He didn't have to. As everyone knows, he's had a challenge over there, and he's overcome it. And now he's come to the point where he's ahead of everyone, and he, he's willing to share that with the others in the community. I think it's a wonderful thing. We should recognize him for that, thank him for supporting Mr. Bracey. And uh, when he's holding these classes, to actually have somebody that's gone through it is, I think, a big value. So if I got the support of the board, I'd ask the town administrator if i um, I could work with Karen. We'll draft up a letter of recognition for my signature on behalf of the board to thank Mr. White and his staff for their willingness to help the community. And that's all I have for that. Anything on that? Great. Good no, idea. I think he Perfect. It's a good thing. He did, well, they've been Kitty's through an awful lot, and they, uh, they came through it. And, you know, it's a testament to their... Uh, ability to run a successful business in order to go through that challenge and, and come out uh, as oh, well yeah. as they have and uh, for him willing, his willingness to step forward and yep. assist everybody else to be in compliance is a, is a great service. Yeah, and now they're a leading example uh, in the area for how things are done. So I, I congratulate them on that. It's not an easy effort. Let's see. We still have some time before we get into let's um, – we can do some minutes would be great. Mr. Unless Chairman, I move to approve the November 7th regular session minutes as written. Second. Second. We got a motion, a second, any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 5th executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion, a second by Mr. Mignopelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 7th regular session minutes as written. Second. A motion is second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 7th executive session minutes as written. Second. A motion, I have a second by Mr. Mignopelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 8th strategic planning session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion to second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? The brevity of the town administrator did a wonderful job. Not <laughs> as good a job as Jane does, but you know. The amazing Jane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Michael, keep your day job. That's the point. <laughs> Yeah, any other discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. We have a few more minutes. Uh, let's see. Is there any other administrative things on this agenda we can get to? Mr. Chairman, I think we've had previous discussion on item number eight. I don't know if the board's comfortable voting the motion at this point. Yes. Uh, just to update, uh, so this is the establishment of the Facilities Master Plan Committee, and uh, we took the feedback that was provided during the last discussion two weeks ago, and we modified a motion with a charge. Uh, to it, and um, I don't know if it would make sense to have the motion read, and then I can elaborate. Or it would be helpful if I know we're throwing a little curveball at Mr. O'Leary to dig that out out of order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to establish a facilities master plan committee composed of one member from each of the following boards, committees, and departments: Select Board, Community Planning Commission, Department of Public Works, Historic District Commission, Capital Improvement Planning Committee, Finance Committee, School Committee for terms through June 30th, 2020, and charged with the following. To advise the Department of Public Works on the development of a master plan for town facilities and future town facility needs, provided that the committee consult with the town's public safety departments prior to the finalizing its recommendation. Second. Got a motion and a second. Discussion. So through you, Mr. Chairman, we've added that uh, provision at the end uh, for the committee to consult with the public safety departments. Uh, with the board's affirmative vote, we'll circulate a memorandum to the involved um, boards and committees uh, asking for them to designate a representative from each committee to participate in what we hope will be meetings beginning in January of next year. And all the funding that are, that associated with this has all been approved at the June town meeting? Of uh, October of 2017, yes. Okay. I knew it was a few, years, uh, a few months out. Mrs. Daniel Pelley. Why, why wouldn't the 
Public Safety Director be on that committee as well? I mean, uh, that I, seems to be a, you know, important function for us to have input on the, on the. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, um, the challenge that we face is that there are a, a variety of different departments that are going to have um, in, involvement and, right. and thoughts to be offered, and we, we struggled with expanding the size of the committee to reflect all those departments um, versus this, this committee would be tasked with hearing from all of the departments, boards, and committees that might benefit or have input on um, future facility needs. Public safety, there's obviously two components of it, one of which is their actual building needs, and right. then the second component, which is addressed in the provision, is any insight that they might have from a safety standpoint for any building that we're looking at potentially rehabilitating or constructing. So um, we were careful not to, um, I'll say, uh, favor any one department because there are so many that could be impacted um, with regard to uh, this study. Um, we've talked uh, about the Intergenerational Center, and there's three or four departments that are, are major stakeholders in that discussion. And I think the feeling was that they will be, uh, that this committee's role will be to hear from those departments and to assemble a plan for, for your consideration. So that, that was the reason why. Or why not, I should say. Any other questions? Good. Yeah. No, if you yeah, I think that public safety has oversight over a number of different departments, so that input would be, I would assume yeah, but, that would be but if I could, helpful well, to the committee. So one of the, we talked about last on this, just to refresh everyone, is one of the things I don't think we've done a great job of is anytime we've reviewed our buildings, we don't tend to bring in security like we should. And we need to make all our facilities a lot more secure. And I think it's a very important part of this process that we need to capture it. And we need to be very confidential about what it is we're integrating into these plans so it doesn't get out publicly because then it adds out a vulnerability and we don't want that. And that's, that was one of the rationales behind that. I would cer certainly, um it's the board's okay. determination relative to the composition of the committee. So any other questions? Anyone? If I don't hear any, I, I'll take a, a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, this brings us to the witching hour. <laughs> I'll take the... Um, do we have a public hearing notice, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the Town of North Reading Select Board Notice of Public Hearing, Property Tax Classification Hearing. The Select Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 19, 2018 at 8.15 p.m. at North Reading Town Hall, 235 Main Street, Room 14, to determine the percentage of local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property for fiscal year 2019 in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 56. Interested taxpayers are encouraged to present oral testimony at this hearing or may submit information on their views in writing to the Select Board's office either to the above address or via email to the Town Administrator no later than 12 noon on November 15, 2018. Michael I. Prisco, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Gavardo, I just want to make sure everyone knows if you would like to be recognized, just give me the high sign. There is a fee tonight to be recognized. It's twenty-five dollars <laughs> payable to the town of North Reading, and uh, please just go to the podium, full name, your address. I'd really appreciate it. So, Mr. Gobert, I'll turn it over to you and your team. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you, for the benefit of the board members, in addition to the PowerPoint presentation up on the screens in the room here, the uh, presentation uh, has been added to both the Dropbox and Share File program, so you should be able to access the same presentation there. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the finance director to lead us off with regard to the presentation who's joined uh, by uh, the uh, assessor, uh, Deb Carboni. Excuse me, just real quick. Did you say you were going to put this on the town website as well, or it's already on the town website? It's not on the town website right now, um, but we certainly are, are, can certainly put it up uh, on uh, town news, so it's readily yeah, available. Yeah, just so folks at home were listening if they wanted to look at it while we are doing it, but that's okay. I, I, sh I can do that now. I should. If we could. Should just, just take a few minutes. That would be helpful, and the folks at home that are listening, just give it a few minutes, and hopefully they'll be able to easily find that on our town website mm -hmm. so you can watch along at home, because I know big viewership this evening. So. Ms. Roark. Good evening. Um, the assessor, Debbie Carboni, um, and myself, uh, 
are here to um, review the property tax classification um, and go through the role of you as the select board um, in the tax classification process. I will begin the presentation and then I'll hand it over to um, the assessor to, to continue. Okay. So as we begin every year um, at our tax classification hearing, we review the role of um, the board. Um, the only difference uh, in this slide this year would be um, the select board's role versus the board of selectmen's role. Um, so as the select board, you um, need to, <coughs> um, you know, review the minimal residential factor um, you have to decide on an open space discount. You have to decide on granting of a residential exemption and granting of a small commercial exemption. And we'll go through those um, in detail a as we go through the presentation. North Reading's uh, tax levy profile as of today um, is not much different than as of FY18. Uh, the residential class is 87.64% and commercial, industrial, and personal property is 12.36%. We are um, proposing, and this is an uncertified uh, rate uh, for FY19 of $15.58. Um, and we will go through um, how, we're not going to review tonight how that rate is calculated as we have in, in prior um, classification hearings, um, but that is, you know, all of the work that we've put into for Debbie's, um, all of her assessed values and the processes she has to go through, as well as the piece that I um, have a role in regarding uh, budgetary items. Below you will see the tax levies for the previous three years and then FY19's uh, tax levy. So that FY19, 1558, is what you're proposing. It's not what's in place today. This is what it, we are submitting to the Department of Revenue for certification based upon all of our calculations with assessed values um, and uh, budgetary items that have come, come out of the tax levy. The titles kind of confused me a little bit. Uh, that's okay. Oh, okay. Um, maybe I can clarify? Well, it says the North Reading's levy profile today. And, and today we don't have a 15 This is as of the, for the FY19 tax classification okay. hearing. So right. that is today. That's what we're, we're reviewing is the FY19's profile. Um, and we refer back to previous fiscal years in different scenarios. But the purpose of this um, hearing is to review the FY19. Um, I understand it better now. Yes, no problem. So we've gone over this in previous years, um, uh, what is a split tax rate or um, a dual tax rate? Uh, North Reading has not had a split tax rate um, since 1988. Um, they, we had a split tax rate in 1985 as well. I will let the assessor speak to the income and expense statistics. Um, just one thing to point out um, when we're reviewing this slide, uh, comparing to FY18, um, we mailed out 287 and we received back 180. So as we review this slide, just keep those, those amounts in, in mind. Good evening, everyone. On the income and expense uh, s statistics, the expense reports are mailed out to all commercial and industrial properties of revenue producing. In other words, we don't mail them out to the vacant land or the industrial uh, pipelines and uh, properties of that magnitude. The return on the reports 
are pretty stable. We did have a, a decline this year for whatever reason. I looked back on the history of the reporting and it's that we've had this percentage of 53% before. With that being said, the income and expense reports are analyzed whether the properties return them or they don't. So the properties, and I'll give you a scenario, when we have the returns for retail property, we break all those retail property returns down of like kind. Like kind also location. So in other words, a retail property on Park Street and a retail property on Main Street are, will yield a different price per square foot. And that's what we base our income values on. The base price per square foot along with a vacancy rate and an expense. So that being said, even if the properties do not return their reports, they are still assessed fair and equitable against the same property of use, retail, office, et cetera, and location. Are there any questions on that slide? Mr. Schultz. Mr. Carbone, I, I mentioned this last year. I, is, is this form that's sent out, and I filled out for my business, are these state forms or are they North Reading forms? This one is a state form, and looking back at um, some of the discussion we had during classification last year, in my apologies, I did not get around to holding that workshop that I had said I would. Because the reason I, I ask is the form is so complicated. It is. it's cheaper to pay the $250 fine than to pay your account to fill it out. Is there any way we can simplify that form for the business owners? Well, my hope is, I want to say it was around April, I did receive an email from the Department of Revenue stating that they are revising that form. So, I have not seen a sample of that form yet. My, if their form is not conducive to what I'm looking for to simplify what I'm mailing out to the commercial <coughs> industrial owners, then yes, I will make an appoint to change that form. We have to do something about a 53% non-compliance rate. That's ridiculous. Uh, it, it's actually not that uncommon well, amongst other communities. It's still ridiculous. We had 12% yeah. when I first it joined the be, board. We need to get a form that's easier to use and more user friendly, and we'll get people that send them back. I mean, it's cheaper to pay a 250 than to pay your accountant the way that form reads. I can tell one thing we did uh, do in the office before they were mailed this year. If it was retail, we highlighted the areas that we wanted them to mail out okay. because I did not get to have that workshop. I just didn't have time. All right. Mr. Messier, um, I'm sorry. That's what needs to be said, Ms. Sarah. Debbie, I, I want to go back a couple slides. Uh, you had a total levy in FY18 of 49 million, 7,000, and I won't, I won't repeat the change. And then in FY 2019, 50, 771. And if I take 2.5% of the 49,007, we're missing 539,101. Is that new growth? We actually certified new growth at 753,000 this year in change. Then how does the total levy? Get, go from 49007070 to 57713488. Thank you. It seems to me that, oh, it's 2.5% of the new growth. No, no, it no, would be two and a half. Than I two and a half percent plus your new growth, right. excluding your debt. So you need to take your debt and you need to back that out of 
the increase you're looking it's, for it's talking, in our uh, our debts around six million. So override debt, right? Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Yes. Thank you. Anything else on this slide, Mr. Masseri? No. Okay. You can go back to the. Anything else on this Anything slide? Anything else on income and expense? I mean, we got to continue to stay the path we're on. I believe with um, leaving the structure we have in place, but I do. I would like to see that workshop happen. And I agree. And I think we need to offer it more than once because not everybody's available on the same night because it's important. Um, you know, but it, it has come way up from where it was, uh, but it's not good. And I think there's more reasons than just having a difficult form to fill out uh, is why it's happening. But nonetheless, we're doing the best we can. So I want to thank the 139 that did say. Please go on to the next slide. <clears throat> this is just a breakdown of our property classes uh, that we have in town. Um, we also list the average single family home value for FY19. And we will review um, the changes in uh, home values later on in the presentation. These are the required uh, votes of the select board, and I will have um, Debbie review those with you. So the open space discount, the town in North Reading actually does not classify open space as any classified property in the town. Open space does not mean large tracts of land. It actually has to have the classification of the open space to classify for the discount. So we do not have any, but you still do have to take that vote. The residential exemption, the residential exemption and the commercial exemption, what this does is the select board has an option to shift up to 20% of the class tax burden, not the value, just the tax. So what happens is back on slide three, that total levy will not change. That levy will remain the same. What you will do is you will shift, it's hypothetically, let's say 10%. So our average house being 578307 that would have no change. But a house that costs 350000 would be reduced in tax by that 10%. But that 10% from the lower, the lower valued home will shift over to your higher valued homes above the average single family. So you're only taking the, the levy and you're shifting the tax in values. That's all you're doing. Here's a scenario for the 10% exemption uh, based on the uncertified rate that we currently have. In there you can see for the average home of 578307 the taxes for FY19 would be $9,010.02. A house valued $100,000 less would actually save the $745.20, but that $745.20 will be shifted over to the higher valued homes and 15 percent i just put in the 15 and 20 i i always have those in the presentation we can go to the next one so the small commercial exemption actually works the very same way the only difference in this is to define eligible parcels the Department of Revenue submits to all assessor's office a report of valuation of businesses in the town. 
they have to be valued less than a million dollars, be owned and employed less than 10 employees. With that being said, we have, we do go through the exercise and there are 33 of them. Um, and that number has stayed the same historically for as long as I know. And you know that there's 33 because they return the forms to you? No, because I'm notified from the Department of um, Unemployment. Okay. So I have one of my staff members go through each and every business in town for value and employees to see if we have any, if that 33 changes, basically. So the classification, the select board may shift the town's tax burden from the residential class to the commercial, industrial, and personal property, otherwise known as CIP. Classes as long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor. North Reading's minimum residential factor is 87.64%. I do want to explain that a little bit for anyone who doesn't quite understand that. So our total valuation, 87.64% is all the, on the residential. That means 12.3% make up the commercial industrial and personal property and this is just the um, the pie that shows you the percentages this is what if the select board chooses to shift the rate and again what what will happen is the residential tax rate will be reduced and if that percentage of taxes that's reduced from the residential will shift over to the commercial industrial and personal property this year um, in our classification presentation um, we have added a slide to just do some comparison um, over previous fiscal years. So you will see FY17, 18, and FY19 with the uncertified rate of $15.58. You will also see uh, values, assessed values of uh, properties within, within town. And we do it breaking it out by uh, the lower end to the average to then the high end and you can see in the lower end um, <coughs> column here that in FY17 the um, average assessed value was $245,600 and then we have FY18 254.8 and FY19, 337.9, which is a 32.6% increase over FY18. In FY18, that um, average class only increased 3.7%. Uh, we also did this exercise for the average single family home value of 578.307 which um, is a 7.6% increase over FY18. In FY18, the average single family home value increased 10%. Moving on to uh, the high end uh, assessed properties, we see that um, in FY18, um, the value increased 2.8% over FY17. And for FY19, we see that the values in that this class range increase 1.5% over FY18. We did the same exercise for uh, commercial properties. Um, and you can see that the lower end values are listed here. 
And you can see that in FY18, the average of this lower end uh, assessed values was 767,400, and that was a 4.3% increase over the value assessed in FY17. The same exercise was done for FY19. Um, the value you can see increased uh, a lar much larger um, than it did FY18 over 17, and it increased 15.9%. Uh, same thing for um, the median and the high properties. Thank you for doing this slide because I think it's important for people to see this. Hey, you know, when we talk about what our average increase was for the year for the town, it doesn't mean my home went up actually that average. It, you know, my home maybe went up one and a half percent, where somebody's now went up 77.6%. 7, 7 so when we talk about these averages, we just, this was a much more, I think, more transparent about. You know, why people get the tax bills and they talk to a friend and they're only getting a little one and a half percent increase and they're getting seven and seven point six. Now people understand it. And same with the commercial base. Uh, you, you can see they go through the same thing, too. Um, you know, and I think when you look at this historically, it's a pretty interesting chart. Um, you know, maybe in another year or two we can do that. But thank you. This is, I think, uh, much improved to have this slide it really gives full disclosure to the community. So what they can they can understand, Mr. Masseri. Proposing a tax rate below this current year is a result, I think, of a recent uh, reval. So I'll just start, and then you can. Um, so it's a whole combination of things. Um, new growth. Uh, new growth. Um, values being up, and I'll, I'll let Debbie speak to speak to that. Um, you know, we analyze every year the change in the, the tax rate when we are done collecting our, our field data and, and then inputting all of our budgetary information from town meeting. And so um, the assessor and I spent some time discussing the, the reduction of 76 cents basically between FY18 and FY19. Um, just keep in mind it is an uncertified rate, but everything ties out for us. Both her uh, values have already been certified, and my information is all tied out uh, according to town meeting. So it, it is a whole combination of things. Um, new growth came in at 250,000 250, over um, what was budgeted for us. Um, also, the values have increased. It is not a reval year, but um, I will let the assessor speak to you know some of the no. reasons why the values have increased. But, but new new growth basically impacts the levy limit, yes, does it yes. not? It increases it, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So how do we get a lower tax rate on that? It has to be assessed valuations have gone up. Yeah, it, it's a whole combination of things, but new growth does pay a, pay, pay yes. a factor. Positively, though. Right, okay. positive. it's a positive yes. fact. Yes. I think you know, as you Very can see, positive. we need no, more new growth. I mean, I, I, I'm if, if if assessments go up, mm -hmm. right? Somebody with a reduced tax rate still may end up with a bigger tax bill. Yes, and I'm just trying to understand that. Yep, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'll turn it over to this. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I just like to elaborate on Bob's last comment there. He's, yeah, he is right. correct. And Somebody sure. could have an increase in their tax bill, but there's many reasons that that would be justified. Number one, if they had a building permit. If they had a building permit and they put on an addition or they, you know, renovated their entire house, um, those, those are drivers that would increase their value. And my job is to get to fair market value, what you can put that house on the market for and yield within a 10%, because there's no appraisal that will ever be exactly the same. So that's why industry standards is usually a range of like 10%. No, uh, my, my issue is not with you following the rules and doing mm -hmm. your job. It's more the fact that the 
smaller homes in the town, right, have been impacted over the past few years with greater appreciation because they're being bought up, they're being rebuilt, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, those people that are staying in their capes and their small ranches, right, are slowly getting driven out of town because their tax rate is increasing at a, not the rate, but their tax bill is increasing at a higher percentage than some of the bigger homes. In this town. is why I asked for this slide, Mr. Missary. As you can see, you take that three hundred thirty-seven thousand dollar home, you know, the increase is thirty-two point six percent. And if you take a million dollar home, yeah, no, I, it's one I point understand. Six. That's why I just wanted us to have full disclosure to the community yeah. on this because that's exactly the, no, the, the I guess situation. What I'm saying, as a board, we need to pay a little more attention to. We it. do, and the only way we can fix that is, you know, we can't drive the market, but all we can do is. If we focused on new growth, we can help stabilize it a little bit more. And I think you're seeing, if we didn't have the new growth that we did, that number would be higher, correct? Well, maybe slightly higher, because I know new growth factors into the levy, yes. but it would be higher. Yes. And, and that's the key, that's the foot stomp we need to take from this. The board should continue on its strategic plan efforts to increase new growth, and it's working. That's the bottom line, for both commercial and residential. So to elaborate a little bit on the lower end homes, we actually, we're in a trend right now. Real estate always has different market trends. And right now in this quadrant of the state, we're seeing a lot of our lower end homes. Okay, if we have them assessed for 350,000, but they're selling them to a developer or they're selling them to a contractor for 450,000. That's the driver that we're seeing for the lower end homes taking the bigger hit right now. Our higher end market, it's gone up 2%, 1.7 some of the neighborhoods, but to say average 2% for round numbers, but our lower end neighborhoods are taking the bigger hit, but they're selling the properties for anywhere from 100 to $150,000 over what I have them assessed for. And that's why we actually do the due diligence and go through a mini revalue, if you will, every year. Every year we go through a mini reval. That's it's the interim adjustment, but we don't just factor up, put a 1.5 factor percent globally across the town. We look at it neighborhood by neighborhood, style by style, as if we were doing a reval. So the lower end homes are taking the bigger hit. And it's, it's not just here, it's really in the entire quadrant. Just, you know, talking to other assessors and yeah. serving on other boards. It's cost to come Exactly, exactly. Any other questions on this slide, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, just before, I, I should have uh, done this up front, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be recusing myself from the discussion uh, portion of the public hearing uh, because I have a family member who owns both a uh, residential and commercial property. So I've been advised that I should recuse myself from the discussion. Doesn't mean I can't vote on it again with the recommendation coming from the Board of Assessors for a factor of 1.0 that actually re removes any potential conflict, but uh, in the interest of, uh, first of all, uh, disclosure, and secondly, I don't want to interfere with the process here. I will not be participating in the public discussion. Just make sure the minutes uh, rec recognize that, please. Thank you. Please continue. This, this is all we have. So now um, you have in the motions the votes that are required and the, the votes that we have reviewed uh, with you this evening. Um, well, I'd like to give the public an opportunity to speak if they're interested. Anyone? Speak. Did you want to? Right to the podium, if you don't mind. Full name. Yep. Address, please. Hi. My name is Lisa Egan. I live at 8 Oak Ridge Road in Reading. I'm here on behalf of the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce, of which I am the executive director. 
I wanted to um, respectfully request that you consider a single, maintain your single tax rate for financial year 2019. And I know I just noted that in 2017, North Reading experienced a lot of growth, new development with the JT Berry project, and it's exciting to see all the construction on Main Street with more mixed use properties. I noted in the presentation, right, this year you have 23, and I'm sure that's gonna go up in the next year, which is amazing, because I know all the financial data in Massachusetts Area Planning Commission, MAPC, points to that as one of the key areas of growth for our region, so I think it's wonderful. And I think if we can continue to make it easier for commercial properties to improve their buildings and expand in capital, capital improvements and such, by maintaining the favorable rate, the single tax rate um, that we currently enjoy. I also think it's important just to mention for the public that whether the rate is split or not, it doesn't raise additional funds for the town. I know that that was a point of confusion, um, at least in some of the other meetings that I was at. So I think um, it's revenue neutral, but I know it's very favorable for business to have the lower single rate. And I know the business owners we work with appreciate it and I hope we can count on your continued support with a single rate for the next year. Thank you for your consideration and your time. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Public comment? Sidewalks? <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> wrong hair. <laughs> wrong hair. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carucci, you want? <laughs> Just yell to the microphone. Just a question. Uh, are we gonna be able to question you on when you give your as far as you want to split the rate? Absolutely. Huh? Absolutely. So could I wait to get through with your spiel? Sure. All right. Okay. Or anybody else on the board? Absolutely. No. I'm not interested in splitting the tax rate. What's that? If you're asking if I'm interested in splitting the tax rate, no. Wouldn't make sense until we have storage and down you Route 20. You a battle and you're not interested in I wasn't, I, I don't think I've been in favor of it for the last, well, no, no, no. Go read the minutes. Yes. Yeah, I just want to point out, kind of glom on what Ms. Egan just said. It is, a, I've had a number of citizens reach out to me saying, why don't, to raise money, we increase the taxes on commercial. It's a zero sum game, it's revenue neutral. You're not raising a single dollar, you're just taking it out of one pot and giving it to the other. The other issue you have is because you have 87%, I'm rounding these numbers off a bit, 87% and change residential taxpayers and 12 and change commercial taxpayers. If you do a tax split, you're gonna have a situation where the average homeowner gets enough to go to dinner once a year and the average business owner gets a huge tax increase. So it's not dollar for dollar per taxpayer. So it's, I'm in favor of a single tax rate uh, for the reasons we just mentioned. And I don't, as Chairman Prisco mentioned, I, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly, I don't think we should, something we could even address until we get to a certain point where we have at least a 20% commercial tax base, have sewage, have those types of things in town. Right now is just not the time for that, in my opinion. If we don't have any other questions from, we can close the public hearing, we can deliberate and do the motions. I would suggest uh, maybe Mr. Schultz, the former clerk, maybe uh, read the sure. motions. Uh, I'm going to close the public hearing. Mr. Ch or we gonna second that? Wait, you have to read the motion. You have to read the motion. All right. we'll, we'll take care of it. <laughs> it's been a while since I've done this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to establish a tax classification factor of 1.0 as recommended by the Board of Assessors. Second. I have a motion second. and a, a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. There was a 5 0, right, Mr. Leary? You were able to vote on that, right? Yes. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I move not to establish a residential exemption. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mrs. Mignopelli. Any more discussion? Mr. Messier. I, I find it interesting that we, we're going to have a lower tax rate, uh, but it's going to be borne by 
on average homes that are below the average. That's right. It might be a great year to adopt the exemption. You know, and I'm, I'd be proposing scenario one equal a 10% exemption. shifting the tax burden off of homes below average to above. And how much would the increase go on the homes above again? Is it the 745 in that scenario? That's a scenario for ten percent. A house valued at four hundred seventy-eight thousand three hundred and seven. Yep. So the savings for that house being a hundred thousand below the average is seven forty-five. So it would be incremental yep. percentage based on the assessed value. I'll let other board members go first, and I'll kind of go at the end. Yeah. My my thoughts on that is I. The higher end houses are paying the majority of the taxes right now. I think to add on to that, I think it's a little bit tough. And I, when I look at these assess, as someone who is in the business of doing closings, I see what stuff is selling for in town. I think our lower end appraisals are appraised very conservatively. I don't see anything that's selling for anywhere near that, besides maybe small condos and some of the development, any single family homes. I don't see anything selling for anywhere near 337. So I think. That segment of the population is already getting a break on the taxes because they're not they're not being assessed at what they would sell at in the real market. As you indicated they're selling for hundred thousand dollars over. So I think that discount is already. Yeah, I, I think it's more than that. I agree with you. So I think that discount. Why I'm certainly empathetic to the people that are on the lower end homes. I think they're already getting a discount vis-a-vis -vis through the the assessment. So that's just kind of how I see it. So. Mrs. Manupel, you did help me out here because we have a motion, we have a second. I'm not, I'm not doing the shit. I'm not doing the. And you're asking for a mo Are you asking for us to modify the motion? Yeah, an amendment. An amendment to the motion. Yes. It's it's a competing motion actually. So you're actually. Mr. Gilbert, help me out here. On structurally on this. I agree with the vice chair. I believe the motion would be withdrawn, honestly, or defeated, and then revoted. Right. So. Mr. Basiri, I don't know how you modify the so motion. Okay, uh, his I, I don't have a problem with that. Move Vote not on the motion. Impo yeah. move. His motion was to not implement the residential. That got seconded in discussion. Mr. Masiri, um presented an option. I'll represent it as um, the reason why I'm going to vote against it. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's fair, but I, I think you bring up a great point. I think your motivation is, is spot on. But I agree with a lot with what Mr. Schultz is saying, and I think if our motivation is really to assist those in that lower residential valued homes, I think we should come up with more solutions for them for exemptions based on income. And I think we have the right to do that. We have a lot of exemptions now, and if we want to help them more, we can work on changing some of them and make them even more valuable to them to help them offset this. But I think we should do it in the form of exemptions based on income and um, rather than the home value because I think they're getting a very good value on their homes uh, on the other end when they do come to that time in their uh, lives to sell it. So that, that would be my motivation to try to achieve what you're looking for. So while we're on the discussion of that, can, can the assessor just give us a list of all the exemptions that we do offer? She should be here all night. Sure. <laughs> Just a quick, that quick. We do have uh, veterans exemptions that have different qualifications to them. Um, we have an over 70 exemption where that's an income asset. We also have a surviving spouse exemption. And we have, um, we have the, uh, senior work off program which we did that's not an exemption I'm just including yeah. it 
uh, because yeah. we Four. are being active in increasing the amounts and lowering ages and um, so the senior work off we did just increase that yeah. amount from 500 to 750 so those are our major exemptions the, um, the veterans this uh, over 70 <coughs> and the um, surviving spouse okay. thank you anyone else mr keller mr keller you mind if you want to mind come to the podium i'll sit right here next to mrs carboni Mr. Schultz has, has got a good Sorry, point. Sorry, Mr. Kelleher, can you just tell the public who you are? Uh, Don Kelleher, room. three cents per lane. Um, your, point, your point's a good one, that the, the values are really higher. The thing that's missing there is that it's only realized that the house is sold. So people that stay in town in, in the older, smaller houses really don't get any benefit if they're trying to stay in town. It's only if they leave and sell the house or if they leave, they sell the house and, and move into something even smaller in town. So I th think there still is an inequity. If we're seeing that kind of growth in the, the lower end of the market, um, it makes sense that that's, that's, that's where people are coming in. They're going to spend a little bit more than, than the value of that house to uh, make it worth more, maybe flip it, maybe move in themselves. But I think the point here is that it's true that there is a realization of that appreciation if the house is sold, but if it isn't, then they're stuck with the tax bill. And I, answer, I agree with you on that. I look at it a little bit differently. I think they're under-assessed right now. So I think they're getting the savings by the fact that they're, they're very under-assessed even in like this fiscal year. I think that's where the savings could look for that price point of home. Because I don't see anything selling anywhere near that average price for the lower we have for the three I think it was 330 something I haven't seen a single single family home in North Reading sell for that in years so I think they're getting your discount vis-a-vis -vis through the assessment now if it sells yeah yeah but that's why I, I my motivation would be to help those folks out based on an income basis in an exemption somehow and if we don't have something and we want to create something new I'd be willing to listen to it I think that's where our motivation should be because my generation now is moving out of the larger homes into smaller homes in that lower price range but I can afford those taxes I should pay those taxes so it's not across the board and that's why I think our motivation should be for based on income for those people that live in those those value of homes and just to clarify Ms. Keller I don't think it's so much when they sell it's even right now they're being under tax based upon really what the fair market or their value of their that's, home is now. That's a really strong point. So that's what I'm saying. That's where I think they're getting the break. It's being built into the assessment now, not when they sell. Yeah, they can sell it for more, but in actuality, they probably could be taxed a lot higher for that house that they're being taxed at 334 at. They're just a disproportionate increase in value that's being taxed. Yeah, that's true. Great. Charge point yeah, the appreciation is much higher in that right. price point. Right. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Lower price houses would appreciate. Yeah. Okay, so we have the motion. Just we have a, a second. Mr. Chairman, yeah, just, uh, just as a point of information, not so much specifically on the, on the motion before us, but I think it's somewhat pertinent. And, and to your point as to where uh, every member of this board is concerned about those who are land rich and cash poor, and you know people have a difficult time paying their real estate taxes. It's important to note that the at tax time, you know, the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts office, the circuit breaker bill, the circuit breaker bill is a tax credit of up to $1,080 based upon income and in direct correlation to real estate taxes paid. So if your real estate taxes are a certain percentage of your income, and again, as they escalate, more mm -hmm. people are going to become eligible yes, for the circuit breaker point. bill. So it's very important for people to understand, you know, while they have the, the sticker shock of an increased bill on the lower assessed properties in town because that's what the disproportionately is happening. More people are going to become eligible for the circuit breaker bill, which is a thousand up to a thousand and eighty dollars tax credit. We have a number of people now that are already eligible for it. I believe that with what's going to happen, what's happening here, more will be eligible, and they should be uh, well aware and should be asking their tax preparers to take a look at the at the circuit breaker for them on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts state income tax return. So there can be an offset for people who have uh, low incomes. Uh, and the valuations of their properties continue to escalate and disproportionately the real estate taxes go up, they could become eligible for the circuit breaker bill. 
valuable information right there. Mr. Masseri. I just want to continue to make the point that we're lowering our tax rate because the assessments of all the values in town have gone up. Disproportionately, the lower assessed properties have gone up at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're not being fair. And that's why I've made the proposal, or suggested the proposal. Mrs. Minipelli. Well, I think that's just one chunk of this. I think the other portion that we heard from the assessor and the controller is that we the new growth added to that because of the new new growth was a driving force in that reduction of 76 cents or 79 cents. So that's just one piece of it. Um, but I, I, t I would tend to agree with the information that we were presented by the assessor that it's lower already in the assessed value in, do in terms of the, those, that price point of houses. My understanding is new growth allows you to the levy limit and therefore it doesn't fully match what you're saying yes we could I just um, add on to what Bob's saying hopefully this will clarify it a little bit when when I'm all done doing the analysis to determine my values that are being certified to the Department of Revenue, the residential class as a whole increased by 8.49%. My commercial and my industrial increased by 10.17%. So it's, it's not that the values are being disproportioned inequitably they're they're not it's a driver the market is the driver the market tells me what values to place on property we only execute that again by whatever the market is driving so i just wanted to give you the percentages of the increase by classes thank you anything else so again, can you just read the motion again? It's been over. sure. Uh, the motion was, Mr. Chairman, I move not to establish a residential exemption. So essentially, keep things as is. So any other discussion? If none heard, we'll vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Four to one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move not to establish a commercial exemption. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mrs. Minipelli. Any discussion? Any, nope. You don't feel the same way with the business community on this? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Is it unanimous? Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend the fiscal year 2019 property tax levy at $50,754,000. Uh, $95.54, which is $16,552.46, less than the levy limit. Second. I have a motion and a second. I'm looking quickly at it, but it looks like the number in the motion is different than the number on the... That's why I asked him to put it up. Yeah. It is, but it, he also mentioned the excess levy capacity. So that's the... Difference. Inclusive. Difference. That number is inclusive of the excess levy capacity. If you had those two numbers up, it would equal the number on the bed. Yes. Yeah. So the good news is we're not taxing to the max. No. A <laughs> few <laughs> cents. Oh, I, I see That's that. why I wanted to bring so, it up. So take a bow. So you're not taxing Liz, to the thank max. you. I will. I just want to note that last year the access levy capacity was nine hundred and twenty-five dollars. So that's big. I, if I may. Yes. I think that's. There's a lot of towns that just go right to the max. I, you know, I know it's not a ton of money, but I think that's you know reflects on the job you guys do in the finance department and the assessing department, and that's a good thing for the town. Okay. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. 
unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend to the Board of Assessors that the fiscal year 2019 tax rate be set at $15.58 per 1,000 evaluation. A motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to not establish a commercial exemption. Actually, we already voted on this. Yes. It showed no, up twice on I, I made it via duplication. <laughs> yeah, we did. I'm on okay, I was, I was, we did that. Okay. So it was sounding familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nothing else, right? I think we accomplished this. Yeah. But I yes. would like to just no. just follow up with Mr. Carucci on something. Mr. Carucci, I, I am a, I'm not a fan of the split tax rate. Uh, I know you don't believe me, but I'm not. Um, I I, but I do. I would say though, if you were sitting in that chair and you found out you had a 32 percent increase on your commercial property, I think you would be pretty upset. So, yes. you know, I know the business community feels that you don't don't get a full, fair value for the money you pay in taxes. But remember that number next time you're a little upset because I feel bad for those people in that in that range. You know, th that's challenging. So. I'd be upset if I owned an eight hundred thousand dollar home. I understand. I am. I understand. We all have our challenges, but for us, the future is getting the growth on Route 28. And someday, when we're in that high 20% range of commercial verse, then we can have that serious discussion. Maybe it makes more sense then. Well, and maybe it won't. I don't know. But that have the discussion any time before that, I think, would be foolish. And I've said that before, and I'll say it again. Thank you all for coming this evening. And again, uh, Al, congratulations on your play. Um, you. It was very nice. Very Thank nice. You. Sorry you couldn't make it. Uh, you missed a great time, Yeah. Uh, there's so many events that night. Next year. So. Okay. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too, and anyone that's leaving as well, and the folks uh, that are not listening at home any longer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and don't forget... Um, you guys, oh, don't forget to pay your fee for speaking. <laughs> All right. Next on the agenda, we're going to go back to discuss the potential real estate opportunity in 217 Main Street. Mr. Giberto. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, I'm going to read, uh, for the benefit of the viewing audience, a statement that was read at the strategic planning workshop on November 8th. Um, it's a statement regarding 217 Main Street, dated November 8th, 2018. The town is evaluating a commercial property for sale located at 217 Main Street for suitability to meet the town's current and future facility needs. I've asked department heads to identify current and future departmental needs, potential uses of this property, to the extent possible, Don. the nature and cost of potential improvements required for the property to address the town's needs and the overall value of the property. To protect the town's negotiating position for any potential transaction, the select board had a discussion regarding purchase and or value of the property at an executive session meeting held on Wednesday, November 7th, as well as uh, earlier this evening, and will further consider this property at an upcoming meeting. There will also be a uh, public discussion of aspects that are not critical to the town's negotiating position at an upcoming, upcoming select board meeting, which is, in fact, this evening's meeting as the item is on the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll just elaborate. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at uh, a variety of potential uses for this property. Um, it is a, a large uh, commercial property that includes um, garage uh, space, a garage door access, and a former um, water bottling uh, facility uh, to the rear and adjacent to it, as well as a large office uh, area on the front of it. And so we are evaluating a series of potential uses, which would include uh, uses that involve um, the town's uh, rolling stock, uh, such as uh, public safety or public works um, components uh, or components thereof. 
uh, as well as a potential um, office space use as well. Um, I've put up on the screen a copy of the property listing. Um, again, it's the former New England Spring Water property. Uh, New England Spring Water uh, was in business in town here for a number of years, um, and uh, their business uh, was effectively sold um, earlier this year, and uh, the property is now for sale. Um, so our efforts continue with regard to the use uh, and as well as the value, um, and um, I believe that the intention is to have a future discussion relative to this property and uh, unique to this property uh, uh, when additional information is expected to be available uh, one, uh, one week from now, sometime next week. And I'm happy to go through the uh, slides if people think it will benefit. There are photos that are in there um, just for the benefit of those watching at home. I don't know how well it's coming across there, but I could scroll through very quickly. There's only a few pages. If you don't mind, scroll through them. This is the view of the property looking from um, maybe 100 or 200 feet in from Main Street. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with the location, um, it has uh, two buildings on the, pro on the property. Uh, one is a, a single story office building. That's their former uh, water uh, filling station uh, on the northern side of the building. And then behind it is this larger building that's pictured here. And just going through, you see uh, a view from the side. This area where I'm kind of scrolling here is a, an office space in the front. You're looking inside of the area with the garage component over here. Um, this is uh, former uh, storage uh, racks that were uh, within the property. This shows a, a footprint of the building um, in a schematic form, as well as a layout of the parcel of land for the property. Uh, here there is a, uh, a couple of uh, unaccepted ways uh, or paper streets uh, in Harrison Avenue and Talbot Road that are near the property. And that is the conclusion of the available information from the listing. And, and there is a property in the front. There's a building in the front. Yeah. That's correct. That's the, uh, it's, it's uh, an uh, occupied building at this point, a single, single story office type building that uh, fronts Main Street. Uh, the parcel has frontage on Main Street at that location, as you can see, it kind of expands out to the east and then uh, flares out up here uh, for the total <coughs> parcel. And again, just uh, by way of the particular property, uh, it's a 2.88 acre parcel with a 36,000 square foot industrial building. Thank you. So we, we are we going to try to get together again next week, maybe, to discuss this more so we can get some more information? That's the intention, yes. So um, the board wants to take maybe an opportunity now to quickly look at your calendar and see if and we don't have to spend a lot of time, maybe an hour or two? How I, I believe that, that that would be sufficient. And just, you know, in full, full uh, you know, the interest of full transparency, uh, I would anticipate that the discussion would be partially centered up along uh, potential use and then... Um, uh, also a determination relative to the building suitability for our needs and then uh, finally a potential uh, at the board's discretion uh, executive session relative to the town's negotiating position that could all be so done in one single meeting obviously would the, the board be agenda. willing to do in a morning meeting would that be easier in everyone's schedule so you free up your evening no not at all next week evening not for the, in the evening all right, then we'll, we'll have to make it in the evening. What day in the evening works best for you, you Mrs. Minibelli? Yeah. How well, much time do we need from? About an hour and a half? No, I mean uh, to be able to meet. We need at least a week, right? For what? Uh, so, I mean, yes, my, my suggestion would be to look to the latter half of the week, uh, if at all possible. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, Friday? I'm probably going to be tied up Thursday night. But I don't know that yet. Um, there's a potential. And then Wednesday night, I'm free. And I don't know if you want to do it Friday night, but you know. No. no. I'd rather not. <laughs> so I guess it's either it's Wednesday like or Thursday. Yeah, that's, like, that's, like, that's when like, I go, soon I go to Market Basket or something. You know, <laughs> it's a big night out in the town. I don't, I don't have Wednesday. <laughs> Thursday, I can, I'll can. i try to make sure. Available? So Thursday is? I don't know. Do you want to do on Thursday? What's your schedule? What, or how early can you do Thursday? T Thursday night. <laughs> what time, Mike? Well, how, how oh, we're trying to get there, Mr. Mosseri. Six. Six o'clock? 
can't do 5.30? You need to find a better day job. Six o'clock Tuesday, Thursday evening. Uh, does that work with everyone? And you say that is it going to be open session or public session or both? Uh, I would expect a combination of both, yes. Executive session and open yeah. session. Yeah. Thursday the yes. 29th. It's okay with me. Six? Six o'clock it is. Thursday the 29th. 6 a uh, 6 p.m. and we'll put an hour and a half in there, uh, roughly. I think that's sufficient. Uh, maybe two hours to be, con you know, on, on, on the outside end of it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? Any questions? Are you taking any discussions? Are you taking any discussions? You're welcome to go to the podium and. Um, Rich Wallner, 57 Lakeside Boulevard, um, uh, representing uh, Social Services Action Team, uh, ACT, which is a private org, Council of Aging Board. I think that's everything I'm doing. Um, I recall about three, four years ago visiting the CIT um, uh, um, meeting, and we were sitting there talking about various needs that the town needs to be thinking about. And um, of course, you know, uh, Bill Warnick was there and he was talking about the need for a fire station. And Mary was there talking about the need for an intergenerational community center. And I think there was also a need for creating some sort of a community center. And at the time I was talking about that, I was, I was a little shocked that I even thought the idea of the intergenerational community center would be an objective at that time in compared to these other projects. And so I said that from my point of view, I think there's many competing needs going on and as soon as I see us spending $4 million for some property or something like that, um, I'm immediately thinking that what I said was we should be having as a town a very open discussion about all the competing needs that are going on and we should be having a very rational discussion about you know, what the priorities are. Um, and kind of left it at that. So this is the first time I've actually heard that we're planning to invest some money into town facilities when we haven't done the facilities master plan or these other things. Um, so I'll just remind the board that um, the uh, CPC has sponsored um, the MAPC 10-year strategic plan. Um, the 10-year strategic plan has had great um, public input, both in the survey and in um, people who have come out to visit and look at the boards that have been presented by the MAPC. And there, it, there are a number of people in town who really do want to see a community center who really are concerned about um, the affordability of housing and that um, we need to address Main Street. And I'm not saying that fire safety isn't important. I'm not saying we don't need a town hall. And these are, again, all competing um, objectives that we all have. But I think if we bring this up, we have to bring everything else up. And this, this information is going on right now. There will be a report coming back to the board I think it's almost premature to be doing this and drawing conclusions. And I don't know your schedule, so maybe that's not what you're, where you're at. But it's, it's kind of seems premature to be drawing conclusions on what we do with this if we haven't thought about where else we could be investing our money. I'll also say, last point, without any questions, is um, when we were doing, I used to be a member of the EDC, and when we were coming up with the Pulte, when we came up with the, the bids for the uh, property on Lowell Street, Pulte made two two offers. They made an offer of $30 million, um, no affordable housing, and they made another offer of $18 million with affordable housing. I was in support, as, as everybody else was, that we should go for the $30 million because it was outside of town, and that it would be good that it wouldn't have a direct impact on our town. Um, in the thought that we were thinking is that you take the differential at $18 million to $30 million, you take that differential and you actually do use that extra money to create affordable housing, potentially in the, a new downtown area. And that was, that was verbal, that wasn't a writing, but if you do the math, that's basically about $9 million we were talking about from the sale of the Pulte property that could be used for that purpose. Um, so I'm reminded of that conversation, I'm reminded we consciously thought about that, and there's no doubt we have housing needs for our seniors who need to downsize, who are in two larger properties, and there is a lot of interest in doing something very similar in North Reading that they're doing over in Linfield, which is they have half, half market condos for the residents of their town right next door to Lin, uh, Linfield 
market comp, market street, and it's been a really good synergy between the two. They work very well together, um, and it's all in walking distance. And I think there's a great amount of energy that I've seen from the town and from the people who have done surveys that people want to see that happen as well. So I think all of this is great. We need to make many improvements. Fortunately, we have you know 20 million sitting around to do something with. I think it all has to be thought of at the same time, and not just you know strongly proposing that we don't take reactive planning measures, but in fact we take, let's do a master plan like CPC is working on and look, look at this all at the same time. And if we happen to miss this opportunity, there'll be other opportunities. I'm not worried about that part. But having a master plan that really satisfies um, the people and their interest, um, I think is very important. So I'm, I'm probably jumping in. I don't know your discussions. I'm just trying to give some perspective and encourage you to hear what CPC has to say from the MAPC studies and I have some of the initial findings, but it's, you know, the, the final report would be more interesting. Thank you. Questions? No? Thank you. Just a comment, Michael. Sure. Uh, Rich, uh, you know, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, this thing came out of nowhere, and we couldn't build the existing facility for what they're asking <coughs> as a town. So. What we put in it is still up in the air, and it is an opportunity that can go away pretty quick. Sure. That's the issue. So it's not like we're, we're going off in some direction that we're not paying attention to what's been discussed in the past. Okay. I mean, I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, I'm just alarmed all of a sudden <laughs> to hear it's coming up. So Correct. Without having the other discussions, at least, you know, or at least acknowledge the other the other plans that are out there, and especially what that 10 year strategic plan is saying, because again, there's a lot of interest and a lot of people. And I, I think the survey results is based on like six, 700 people by that year. And it's been surprising the results that they've been consistent in what they've had to say. But I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, 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 Rich, I appreciate your, uh, your coming and uh, reminding us of a few things. Uh, again, I'm of a similar mindset where this is a terrific opportunity in relation to, you know, we have an obligation to take a look at it and we have some needs uh, that, that will have to be met and should be met um, and this may help help do that. But by the same token, I think we have uh, potential other opportunities uh, with limited resources uh, to invest in looking at an overall strategic plan in relation to, you know, how are we going to you know, take a look at what the Planning Commission has put together and what the vision is, for, you know, we're going to, tr to create a, uh, a downtown area, you know, because we've been fractionalizing our, our community uh, services we're all over town now, as opposed to having the old center of town that we used to have. And some people like to have a, a sense of community where, you know, municipal buildings and services are somewhat in close proximity, and then you can, I, th I firmly believe that, you know, the community, the town of North Reading, uh, will probably have to be the impetus for a lot of what's going to take place on Route 28 if we want it to succeed. And, uh, you know, so, so I, for one, am going to, you know, take a hard look at it, but we have to take a hard look at this because of the timing uh, and the opportunity, and the facility really is, uh, you know, pretty good as far as, you know, meeting some of the needs that we have. But, uh, you know, so, but we have to make a decision in short order to let the owners know what is our level of interest. Uh, Rich, were you here when we went over the uh, facility master plan committee and we talked about that? Were you, were you present? I was, I was here. Yeah. Okay, good. So, I, uh, I shared the same concern as you did, Rich. Well, I, I don't know who said it, but like, um, you know, the demographics of town is. Rich, could, could I just have you come maybe sit here if you yeah, So, just let the folks go home so I can hear you. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the demographics of town, I mean, this is the most pressing issue is the youth of North Reading is, you know, the school enrollment is 2,500 going down, and the seniors is 24% going up to 40% in 10 to 15 years. It's an undeniable uh, number that's going to happen. I mean, it's happening across Massachusetts, but never more so than right here. And it's very important that we keep our community together for these older people. They underfund, they underwrite the schools. If you do the math of taxes, um, you know, if you take taxes, I pay $9,000 a year, $6,000 goes, goes to the schools, basically two-thirds, right? But 
if my son, when my son went to school last year, as Bob always told me the number is like $20,000 for my son to go to school. I depend on the empty nesters. I depend on the seniors. And I depend on my neighbors who have kids that are underage to help underwrite my child to go to school. And nobody ever does that math. They don't think about that. But we really have to create a, a supportive community for our adults and keep them in town as much as possible because they're actually they're really fundamental what we're doing. We kind of forget about that. So it's really important that we be planning for that type of thing. And uh, I totally agree with you. All the, all the studies I've done, you know, if you talk about traffic calming, um, it's a big deal. People get the traffic calming. And when I mention that, people, same as when we sat there at uh, I, uh, um, the donut shop. You know, as soon as I said, can we change the route, you know, uh, Route 28, you know, it was like, change the world. That's like a whole new deal. People are really, they really want to do that, but you have to create it there, there, and the more you can create an energy into an area that you develop, that you really focus on, the better chance you have of succeeding throughout 28. And well, I don't want to leave you any impression that we are not looking strategically at all that. This opportunity has come up unexpectedly. We have to address it. Right. We have to at least look into it. I think the facility master plan is a very important piece to the puzzle. And discussions are continuing on in looking at the long term. What do we do with our seniors from independent living all the way to assisted living? What do we do? You'll see that in the next discussion in our strategic plan that's going to get hopefully get approved tonight. It's still an objective. It's still a priority for next year for us to continue to invest in it. We are land rich in town, in cash poor. We have a lot of opportunities where we could work out something. You've heard me talk about the Carpenter Road, Carpenter Drive area, we got 10 acres up there. We could build these facilities that you're talking about in there. We're still working with Representative Jones, Senator Tarr, on a potential grant to build a community intergenerational center. And I think we're in the running for it, I really do. All those things are still on the table. None of it goes away if we consider this building. This is one piece of a solution to help us with many facility challenges that we have. So, okay, I okay. appreciate that. Yep, thank you. Thank, thank you for your comments, though they're important. Yep. Okay, next on the agenda is approve the strategic plan for 2020 and beyond. Hear it first, and then uh, I'll make the motion. Yep. We're gonna go through the. Yeah, I, I thought what I would do is, um, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, so I, I'm sure you're going to be describing the presentation that was made to the department heads earlier today. Um, one thing you'll note is the comments that came up in that discussion I put on in purple. purple. Um, so that's where the new color Thank came you. From. That's helpful. I was sitting there trying to think in my head, God bless thank you. what those comments were. I knew I'd get to it, but you made it easy. So thank you. So the folks sitting at home, um, what did we meet, two weeks ago? Or is it about two weeks Ten ago? Days ago? And we have our annual strategic planning meeting, which is open to the public. Uh, we held it over at the police station. And what we did is we just updated this plan. And I'll go through that really quick here. There we go. So we didn't make any changes to our mission statement. We still believe in it firmly. Same with the vision. Um, what we did on our progress assessment, I don't think we added anything on this slide or on, well, this is not the right, because the secure the funding for MWRA project. So I don't believe that the progress assessment slides were updated because of the focus on the strength, weakness, opportunity, threat, and the objectives. Um, so this should be the correct version. With the changes showing up on the next slide. Okay. I hope so. They put it right there for some reason. All right. Here we go. Before I come back to that, um, I just want to touch upon the SWAT side of things, and then we'll go back to the objectives. So from the strengths, we added in the long-term stable quality water source. I, on the weakness side, we have two sections of this. We have weaknesses tied to an objective and weaknesses without a dedicated objective and on the left hand side we added in the word assisted for our lack of affordable senior and assisted housing we think we need to also in, in bring that into our analysis as well we didn't have that before um, fragmented social media presence 
we add, we discussed that today. You want to add anything on that? Um, only that we had a discussion and that there is an objective that's on there um, that we're going to look closely at for the fiscal year 2020 budget process. I think the board probably remembers it was something that we had in there in fiscal year 2019, but we're not able to implement. Um, so this weakness actually does now tie to an objective, and that's why it was um, moved. And it was moved from the right without an objective to the left with an objective because the board, in fact, did put an objective on. Yeah. That's why it's permanent. But I'll say, I thought maybe you would share with them in the discussion with the department heads today. We talked about if we end up creating a social media presence, it's like anything else, like the website. If we don't continue to update it, it's no good. And I've challenged them to get together, work together collectively as department heads to come up with ideas on how to build new social media, to create new presence, and build things that they can take control of and update with good information. Good information in, good information out. No information in, no information out. And they understood that. I think they liked the idea. I think they were energized about it. So I hope, Mr. Gilberto, they'll work with you and continue to help us meet that new objective which we're going to come back to. So that was the main part of this here. I'm not so sure they felt the same on the public perception of the customer service at the town hall, um, but we, we were very, very honest with them. I think it's important that we continue to remind everyone in town we are a public service organization. We are a customer service organization. And that if we can all share that all the way down through the uh, departments to the employees, I, I know, I have a feeling, this will have a nice strike through it next year. Let's see. Opportunities. Uh, we added one change from last year to this year, you know, planning for a capital expenditure of the Berry Project sales. So we, as a collectively as a board, with FinCom involved, others of financial planning team involved, we should have a capital expenditure plan. And, we'll go, and I think the facilities management uh, plan will help us as well come up with that. We also added seeking opportunities in the state bond bill. What a big opportunity. We discussed that today with the other employees in town. A lot of them didn't know anything about it. I encouraged them to get themselves educated. I am going to take the task to um, reach out to Representative Jones with the town administrator to see if there's a way we can get him to come in or somebody from his staff to come in and help us understand a little more um, about the state bond bill and the opportunities and how we go about it. We spent, a, I think, a significant amount of time talking about the grant writer, and I think everyone was in agreement that this is a valuable option for the town. And I know we're going to come back to it when we get to the objectives. But expanding our grant writing is something that everyone should take on, and each department head uh, is willing to do that. They're energized to do that. And evaluating the regional water resource needs, and that was kind of relates back to our discussion about what are our neighboring towns that now that we have our water that we need how do we maybe expand on that by connecting to other towns that may have a challenge like we did so we have one a backup resource to them and them have a and help our local communities as well because we know water is a, a precious commodity and we should um, try to be good neighbors on that so we add climate control or climate change as a threat we do see it as a threat and it's continuing to get worse as you can see, we've already had snow, and here we are in the middle of November. Uh, infrastructure, we talked about our bridges. Uh, we added bridges to make sure we highlighted it. We don't want to lose sight of it. You know, we Bridges are a very uh, challenging thing when they're very expensive when they go to, to replace them. So we're going to add a little more focus on it. And then the trends, we added in increased labor costs. Uh, we see that continue to trend upward. And then the limited availability of qualified personnel for open positions. The reason why is because the unemployment rate is getting lower, which means it's, a it's harder and harder to attract people. So we have to be a lot more creative in how we do things and potentially have to increase our labor costs to bring people in. So now I want to go back to the objectives. And you can see we struck the first one off. We did secure the funding for uh, the Andover Portable Water Solution. We're well on our way. We really are, we updated in the refined, the collective bargaining strategy. It's time that time of year now where three years have gone by pretty quickly. Uh, we're about to be there pretty quickly, so we have to start creating our new strategy, and that's underway. 
and the wastewater implementation, Mr. Masseri, Mr. O'Leary have now transit not only continue to wrap up the water um, with the FEIR, they've also increased their attention on the wastewater plan and implementation. They're spending a tremendous amount of their personal time on this. Mr. Masseri is working on developing a financial plan, which hopefully will be at some point by the end of next year to be able to share that and to complete the FEIR, which are well underway. Um, technology, one of the areas we want to try to accomplish here in the next year or two is the permitting. How we do permitting here in town, we want to automate it, we want to make it more user friendly, and we need to make it more efficient for our department heads to be able to have access, sharing, signing off, and being able to assist our customers who have permits. And security, I mentioned it earlier, and it's something that we have to continue to make it as a priority. We have to make sure our facilities are secure. Employee tracking time control solutions. Uh, we talked about it this afternoon with the employees. I think everybody understands it, and I hopefully we'll find, have that solution in place in the next year or two. We updated on the top right the capital plan for the use of the Berry funds. That's ongoing. Let's see, down at the bottom, we added four new objectives. Explore options for early voting, town elections. Um, Mrs. Stats, I think, is uh, a little overwhelmed by that objective, and I know there's challenges. She knows there's challenges, and I believe it's being looked at. She informed us today that at the state level is trying to, or the legislation is looking at this <coughs> option for all communities. So, you know, we're right on pace with other, we other people are thinking about it. So I think it's a good objective. I think what people witnessed in this past election a few weeks ago, how valuable it was. We had a great voter turnout, uh, probably better than we ever had for an election like that. And I think we can get that same kind of increase for local elections. So and we, we had support. close to 20% of eligible voters vote early. That's, yeah. That's excellent. And we should learn from it and try it to bring that to our local vote and as well. I, I did go to the early vote uh, primarily because we were going to Seattle and I was afraid I might not get back. And uh, I thought it was well done, organized, and it was efficient, and there was a flow of voters. Thank you, Mr. Masseri. Pursue, we had pursue public relations and communication personnel. This goes back to social media I believe right mm -hmm. some of those things so and then pursue a grant writing personnel and like I said the, well, the way I explained it to the department heads today is we are putting it up as an objective but we're not saying we continue on Mrs. McKnight Chief Murphy others um, Amy Lekowitz we have had some great success in getting some grants by their efforts and what I had suggested they do is put together a lessons learned, build a working group within the town hall with the department heads, educate each other on the grant writing, and while we allow the town administrator to pursue it through his budgeting process, analyzing it, what it would take. But there's hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants out there available. If we spend even $50,000 on a grant writer and they can bring in, you know, a million or $2 million a year in grants, I mean, for example, you know, middle of last year, we helped the schools get a grant, you know, $175,000, I believe it was, for, if I have that number right? 170 for security improvements. You know, those, you know, that's $170,000 that now we freed up in our general budget. You know, those, that's a valuable. And, you know, the more we can partner with the state to take advantage of these opportunities that they have out there, the better we would be as a community. So that's why you see that as an objective. And then evaluate alternative delivery of municipal services and that's for anything we have to be honest with ourselves you know how we do how we provide services today with organic labor we should still look at it as how we maybe look at it as alternative labor it's something we it's responsible of us to have to do that and that's why it's up there and it should always be there so that's kind of it in a nutshell mr gilberto if you want to add just anything. a note there was a discussion about an objective relative to sidewalks i put it in the lower left hand corner in purple there thank you for pointing I, that out i didn't know if there was going to be discussion of that or not so mrs mcknight did bring up um and where is it over here and our weakness without an objective she had said that 
you, she talks to a lot of folks in the community, and the sidewalks continue to come up as you know, people would like North Reading to be a, a greater walking community. Uh, unfortunately, we're not designed that way, but she thought it would be nice if the board would consider putting an objective up there to address sidewalks throughout the entire town at some point. Um, I said I would bring it back and mention it since we mentioned it as weakness without an objective. She thinks that maybe even through some of the grant writing, we could find some solutions. What we did over on Havel Street, I think we were very fortunate to do that. The project came out wonderful. The, town, the DPW did a great job with the installation. Um, the, engine, the town engineer did a fantastic laying things out. So we have the capability to do it. We don't have the funds. But she thought it would be welcome, a welcome sign to the residents of town that she's heard feedback from if we would consider adding. And I'll go back to that slide now. If you look down here at the bottom left-hand side, sidewalks, if we would consider adding a new objective for sidewalks. And that's Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I, I think it's... Uh I mean, we even talked about it. Oh, I, I, know. Know how, I don't know how it did make the list, but it, we, we had some lengthy discussions about it, and I think it's uh, an ongoing objective that we try and do, but again, the resources aren't there, and I think we should start, uh, again, go back to what we did before, and earmark some funds specifically for uh, maintenance, upkeep, upkeep, and expansion of sidewalks around town. So I, I think it's a... So I mentioned to them that I bring this back here, and I wanted to ask you a question, because going back now almost nine years ago maybe ten years ago wasn't there something we put in place or we were going to put in place that every per was it every don't hold me to this but was it like every permit we were going to take some percentage of dollars and put it away in a sidewalk fund wasn't there something like that almost eight nine ten years ago about eight, I, I, well, I'll go beyond that I'll go way back when when we uh, when cell towers first came into existence maybe that's, that's what, what it was, it was. So cell towers was. first came into existence and we started, we have what's a DPW site and somewhere else. Uh, the original objective of the board at the time was to take the revenue from that, from the cell towers, because again, it's like found money that we didn't have revenues before, and dedicated, if not all of it, but a portion of it towards sidewalk expansion throughout the community. But again, when we ran into some uh, hard fiscal times, you know, that uh, went away and it never came back. So, uh, Sidewalks around town have been an issue for as long as I've been around, yeah, no. and uh, and it hasn't gone away. You know, so uh, we also have had uh, previously when we had a lot of 40B applications for affordable housing, and I know the Planning Commission also through some of their uh, applications for developments in the past have had some developers, as we did with the 40Bs, set aside resources for off-site improvements, specifically expansions of sidewalks and other sections of the community, or signalization, but sidewalks were on the list. And I know the Planning Commission had that as part of their initiatives when they came to, when people came forward with their development plans to have some off-site improvements from where the proposal was, and we did the same thing with the 40Bs. And again, um, a lot of it came down to when we finally got some of the funds for it, if the town were to undertake the development of the sidewalks, the requirements, ADA standards and requirements makes it extremely costly just per foot uh, to put these sidewalks in. And then when you talk about streets like Central Street, which has always been a topic of discussion, right. you look at the ledge that's there and the major the trees, trees that are the there <laughs> in the road. Uh, we had, as part of one of the 40Bs, a um, proposal where they were going to bring it down from, I think, 60... Well, Central Place, down to um, Central Street, down to Park Street, you know, right. put a sidewalk in. But we needed easements from some of the property owners in order to effectuate that, and we couldn't couldn't secure it. We had the funding funding secured through the developer, if we could deliver the easements from the property owners, and we were unable to do that, unfortunately. But you know, so it's it's always on the radar screen, yeah. and we're trying some. Uh, creative ways and in the past again we, we had ready municipal light when they were doing some work they actually we now can walk around you know Havel Street Park Street Central Street by Ipswich Park and back up Chestnut Street there's actually a complete circle now uh, we had ready municipal light when they were proposing some new poles and changes we had them factor in 
uh, completing those sidewalks around that area. So it's always on the radar screen. I think it's a good idea to put it on as an objective and uh, so it doesn't get lost. Yeah, I agree. Mr. Masseri. I was just going to add that in the process of putting the plan together, you got to focus on those roads that have traffic. You know, I live in a street that's not a lot of traffic. Fortunately, there's a sidewalk on both sides of the street and the runners and the walkers don't use them. <laughs> they walk on the street. My whole neighborhood is that way. Right. So, I mean, there's an educational I uh, impact on this and there's clearly, uh, you know, people want to get around. Uh, you don't want to walk in the middle of 62 or some of the other streets. Uh, you know, uh, we just did Havel Street. Uh, where there's a lot of traffic. So I think it can be selective in the plan. Yep. But it's needed. I agree. So anyone have a suggestion on how we want to word the objective? Just put uh, yeah, increase the number and maintain what you maintain what we have. Maintain increase well, I agree. Let's explore yeah. sidewalks. Maintain on, maintain, maintain and upgrade. Maintain and increase. And maintain and increase where, community where, sidewalks. Yeah, main, maintenance is probably a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Where Gaburo. possible. I mean, it's not possible. No, we're probably. Where possible, yeah. We don't yeah. have to be specific. We don't, right. Yeah. We can. That's good. And then I think, do we want to put any kind of a date behind it, or do we want to just kind of leave it general right now? It's an ongoing, I think. Yeah, just ongoing. Yeah. I would I leave it ongoing, and we, you Good. know. So that's it. That's my summary of the strategic plan. If anybody's here interested, ask any questions. Uh, if there's anything else we missed besides the sidewalks. Um, but once we voted tonight, the town administrator will be loading this up on our town website so folks at home can uh, have access to it and go through it in greater detail, and you can always feel free to send any of us your comments, questions, concerns. And, uh, but I want to thank the board again for your extra evening that you gave up to go through it. I think this plan is very important for the town to keep us focused, keep us moving in the right direction. Uh, so if I don't have any other comments, I'll take a motion to approve the strategic plan for 2020. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the strategic plan 2020 and beyond. Second. I have a motion to second by Mr. Minupelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Discuss town meeting, 2019 meeting dates. Mr. Gilberto. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, are we still intending to do a review of the budget schedule and guidance for fiscal year 2020? Did I miss something? Uh, item number 10. Number 10. Oh, geez, I did miss it. Sorry, let's go there. Uh, it's a brief update. Uh, so really, the, the pr presentation of the board's strategic plan to the department heads, which occurred at a meeting this morning uh, by the uh, chair and vice chair, thank you for your time. Um, that's really the kickoff for the budget process uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. So departments uh, will be receiving in the next day or two with their departmental uh, budget uh, worksheets, which they are asked to complete and return back to the finance director no later than December 21st, at which point she and I will begin reviewing their requests and um, will um, schedule a series of meetings in the month of January prior to making a recommendation to the select board in February, which the select board will then uh, consider beginning adherings to the first weekend in March. Um, I'll just note that, uh, again, as we did last year, departments are being encouraged to look at their operations both for efficiencies and for uh, long-term needs in their department or in the community and to develop uh, submissions uh, for our consideration. Uh, we'll then go through those and uh, to uh, offer recommendations to the board. I, I fully anticipate that, as has been the case over the past few years, when the budget is received by the select board in the uh, beginning, middle part of February, um, it will not necessarily be in balance at that point in time, and we'll go through the normal process with the financial planning team to obtain a balanced budget with the goal of uh, no later than the uh, end of April, beginning of May, when the warrant uh, is expected to be signed. Uh, so that's just a brief update. It's very similar to what we did last year. We got a lot of positive feedback, both from departments and from the board. So we're intending to proceed in the same fashion. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions on this right Okay, now we can discuss the 2019 town meeting dates. And as uh, people at home listening, I uh, just want to remind everyone when the town meeting approved us the flexibility of picking a date within the month of June and a date within the month of October of in every calendar year. So what we would like to try to do is schedule our dates for, I believe, for June and October this evening, or at least uh, propose. So through you, Mr. Chairman, this is really intended to be the beginning of a discussion. Um, the board uh, will not be asked to establish the dates until it has a hearing the early part of next year. That's required under the town charter. Uh, the board has the ability to defer that hearing uh, to as late as March now under the changes in the charter, but it would be our intention to ask the board to consider a, um, a date uh, at a meeting in January um, and obviously weather permitting, uh, decide that at that point in time. Really, this was intended to be a, a beginning of the discussion. Um, you see that the town clerk has provided us a series of information relative to religious and legal holidays. Uh, what was not included in the packet, and it was not an intent to frustrate the process, but merely an oversight, was uh, effectively a list of dates that we thought were, uh, were viable options in both October and June for those meetings. Uh, so we'll need to provide that to the board at a future meeting. Um, I'll also email to the board this very document because it has active links that are in it to each of the holidays the board wants to consider it further. Uh, but the bottom line is we do have uh, more flexibility from a standpoint of the board's able to pick any date not in conflict with a religious or legal holiday in either June or October for purposes of setting a, uh, a town meeting date. And Mr. Chairman, I don't know if we want to share some of the discussions in the financial planning team um, as well. I'm happy to do so unless you'd like to. Uh, so we have had some conversations. Oh, so uh, we do have, um, we have had some conversations with the financial planning team and in particular with the superintendent of schools and the uh, school committee uh, representatives. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that we have an eye towards the June town meeting occurring um, at some point in the second week of June. Um, and that really is intended to address the heavy activity in the school uh, system that first week of June uh, with not only the Grand March and Prom on the Monday evening traditionally in conflict with the town meeting, but also preparations for graduation, which occurs later that week, as well as uh, lower grade level activities. I think some of us are aware that we had a to the second night of June town meeting went to a Thursday and there was a significant number of conflicts that particular evening with the school system as well. So um, I, I think the feedback we got is that there certainly, there probably is no perfect date out there, but uh, that second week of June would appear to, to present um, further options uh, for us that would maybe lessen the conflicts that are out there. Um, haven't picked a date obviously at this point in time, but that seemed to be the consensus of the financial planning team discussion. And so I'll provide the, the board additional information for its consideration, and uh, I would expect <coughs> that probably the next discussion will take place sometime in, in January. Yeah. If we want to schedule it in between, Mr. Chairman, we certainly can do that. No, but we have our drop dead date to select the dates are in January. And it's, January. It's, a, it's actually March now. March so now. you have till March. I would encourage the board to consider scheduling a date earlier than March, but you have the ability to go as well, late as March. Yeah, because the school start planning their next gap calendar as well pretty quickly, so. In uh, respect to them, we want to work it around their schedule. Okay, any questions? Thank Are you going to keep it on Monday? Monday Again, night? as a board, you, we can decide what we want. We dealt, we're not locked in on Mondays, but uh, you know, I think we can pick what we think works. Okay, next one. <laughs> Approve and sign the integrated contract for the North Reading firefighters. Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you, so uh, my recommendation would be to pass over that article because we uh, did not have the opportunity to review the document with the board earlier this evening. And because there is uh, one item that's uh, still uh, attempting to be resolved that I don't think is of significance but is not resolved yet. Okay. Town Administrator. Just a clarification. This is taking the, the letter of agreement and integrating into the current contract? That's correct, yes. Okay. The most recent yep. uh, letter of agreement from December or January right. this year. So is there an issue with the fire department on the integration? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, th there's a, I'll, I'll, I would say it's a minor issue um, with regard to uh, representation more than anything else. It's not uh, substantial in terms of impact. I mean, I can brief the board at a further executive session. We just didn't have time to see it. Okay. Okay. 
Mr. Gilbert. Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you, I have two um, comments that I would like to uh, offer to the uh, uh, board and the community. The first is a reminder that we have uh, modified uh, town hall and other non-emergency services schedules uh, upcoming over the next five or so weeks. Um, this evening we were open until 6 o'clock p.m. Um, we had a few people in the building here. Um, we are open uh, tomorrow and uh, Wednesday until 4 o'clock p.m. Closed on Thursday and Friday in observance of the Thanksgiving holiday in accordance with our collective bargaining agreements as well. And then uh, we've moved to uh, extended uh, hours um, in the town hall open until 6 o'clock on Monday, December 17th. The library will be opening an hour early at 9 o'clock that day, 9 o'clock a.m. that day, and it was open at 9 o'clock a.m. today as well. And um, the building uh, town hall and the non-emergency services will be closed on Monday, December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, and on Tuesday, December 25th, which is Christmas Day. And uh, we appreciate the public's uh, understanding and flexibility and uh, also that of our employees to uh, work to identify and develop the schedule. We'll be putting that on the website? Uh, so it's on the home page now. I went up uh, on the page last week uh, and I encourage folks if they have a question just to take a look. We'll leave it up there obviously through uh, through the 20, uh, at least the 25th of December. And through you Mr. Chairman I'd like to read a statement um, as follows. Uh, the following information is being provided as an update to the public statement made on October 1st regarding missing water meters that are unaccounted for and presumed stolen, as well as security and access issues that required improvements to be made. The North Reading Police Department and separately the Human Resources Office and Department of Public Works Administration have been conducting separate criminal and administrative investigations into the missing meters. DPW has reviewed shipping information, invoicing, and installation records. This review has identified that 495 new meters and 20 old meters remain unaccounted for and are presumed stolen. The new meters have an average purchase value of $90 each and the old meters have a value in the form of a credit to the town of 72 cents each. DPW has filed a claim with the town's insurer regarding the new meters that remain unaccounted for. While the insurance company must conduct an investigation to determine coverage, it appears unlikely this loss will be covered due to the individual value of the meters being far below the town's deductible level. As was stated on October 1st, the final projected water meter replacement project costs are projected to be far below the total appropriations for the water meter, meter replacement project. For this reason, at this time, we do not anticipate a need to request additional funding to complete the water meter replacement project despite this loss. Another component of this investigation has been the circumstances that contributed to se security and access issues. October Town Meeting approved funding for various sec security and access improvements and those projects are underway. For security reasons, we are unable to elaborate publicly on the nature of those improvements. Based on the limited information available to date, the criminal investigation has not resulted in the filing of criminal charges for the apparent theft of these water meters. Any new information that becomes available in the future will be submitted to law enforcement for review. Finally, the administrative investigation has also resulted in a need for certain corrective personnel actions to be taken. I am unable to comment on the nature of these personnel actions, but I do feel it important to inform the public that these actions do not reflect any suspicion of theft by the individual uh, employee or employees involved. I wish to recognize the North Reading Police Department the Town's Human Resources Office, and Department of Public Works Administration for their efforts to investigate this matter. Their efforts were diligent and persistent despite the limited available information or evidence. As this remains an open investigation and due to the associated security and personnel implications, I'm unable to comment further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, anything else? No, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and safe travels if you're traveling. And I, I understand the best time to, to travel is 3 a.m. Wednesday morning. <laughs> you'll have, yeah, 3 a.m. Wednesday morning in case you're trying to plan your day and your travels. That's the best time to travel. But truly have a uh, happy uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, the, act, the article actually said that. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, yeah 3 a.m. So uh, happy Thanksgiving and safe travels. And uh, let's go Hornets and beat those pioneers over there in Linfield. 
Mr. Masseri. Uh, I would like to uh, ask the town administrator and the chairman to uh, schedule uh, a board review of the FY 2020 revenue plan. I'm assuming it's still a draft. I understand that, but I think the board should have some idea of where we are with that at this point. Sure. I mean, we could we could put it in um, Dropbox. Yep. Right. Our share file. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's all updated. Um, where are you placing in the FY 2020 budget? Uh, yes, I think that's probably the appropriate place. Go to that folder. You'll find it tomorrow if you can have time. Mm -hmm. to do that. Okay. And second, I'd like to uh, wish the community uh, and the entire board for a happy and safe Thanksgiving. And uh, hopefully, even though it's going to be ice cold, uh, the weather forecast is for some sunshine, which we haven't had much of over the past month and a half. Thank you, That's Mr. Sir. Anything else? Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And for the turkey trotters, it's going to be in the teens with a 20 mile an hour wind, so dress warm and run fast. <laughs> Get behind the wind. Same. Yeah. Wishing everyone a peaceful Thanksgiving, and if you're traveling, safe travels. So I have a couple things. I'll try to be brief. Um, we have on Saturday the Troop 750 Boy Scout Troop uh, is having their Eagle Court of Honor. It's uh, on the 24th, this Saturday at 7 p.m. at Parish Hall at St. Teresa's Church. And let's see if I can read these names out. Daniel Mannion, Jacob Ar Arnucci, Maxwell Murphy, and Rudy Carlson. Congratulations to those four gentlemen uh, on getting their Eagle Scout. They would love the board to participate if you could. Again, it's this Saturday evening um, at Parish Church at St. Teresa's. Um, sorry, Parish Hall at St. Teresa's. Dinner will be served and they would like some representation <coughs> from the board. Unfortunately, it's the night of my 3050 reunion, so I will not be able to attend, but if anyone's available, we could represent the board. I will let them know if you can make it. Anyone? Unfortunately, I, I won't be. A, I will not be available. But I have family obligations. I opened a letter that was in my mailbox tonight, and I've got to go back and see what we've got planned. You know, it's. Uh, it's a timing tough is not great. Yeah. It's, it's a tough weekend. Yeah. No, I know. I just got this today. So. I did go last year. And it's a very nice ceremony. We'll, we'll see kids what do a lot to get to that. No well, worries. Congratulations to yeah. all the boys. It's a great accomplishment. Um, I had the fortunate uh, opportunity to attend the employee appreciation luncheon. I thought it went really well. Um, uh, Teresa's did a nice job with the lunch. We had fairly good participation. I did thank them on behalf of the entire board. I also, for their extraordinary service, I also thank them on behalf of the 16,000 residents they serve on a daily basis. You know, and I, uh, you know, through my, my uh, letter to them, or my speech to them, you know, I try to explain to them, you know, you may not hear from the residents much until something's broken. That's usually the only time you hear from someone when they're not getting the service they think they should get. But I said, you probably don't get a lot of that feedback. And I said, that's a good thing. That's a testament to their uh, their work. It means that when it's not broken, you don't hear from people. That's a good thing. Uh, but uh, they have done a great job, uh, especially as you see the town, how busy we are. You know, I expressed to them that they are truly the backbone of our town. And we thank them again on behalf of the board and wish their families and themselves a uh, happy Thanksgiving. And I also would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you in your families and everyone listening at home. Uh, as well. And the last thing is I left you this little yellow piece of paper at the um, luncheon. Mr. Uh, Collins had handed this out and it's just sort of he's implementing him and the town administrator implementing an opportunity for people just to recognize our staff, our volunteers, uh, anyone in the you know, that works here within town hall. If they've done something that's kind of extraordinary above and beyond they should get recognized. You can fill these out, send them over to the uh, HR director and he'll make sure those individual or individuals get recognized for their work or going above and beyond. So without, without uh, if there's no other comments, we'll take Mr. a- Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.